Is this your last in person class of the semester? Everybody, oh, it's your, it's your last in person. You have another in person class? This is your last. Really? So everybody is done after this class? Literally, the entire class? Welcome to the final class. What should our, like, I'm not going to put it on, but if we had a theme song for this class right now, what should our theme song be? Theme would go your Oh, dude! Now that's a song. I oh, love the movie. God, that's fantastic. What else? What, what else should our song? You could pick the the theme song for this class right now, would be. The Jeopardy song during uh, what stage? Oh, the Jeopardy song. I should add that, shouldn't I? It's not a bad idea. That'd be a perfect countdown. What else? Although I think that would get really annoying with the course of semester here and that's on 75 times like all right i have europe's the final countdown stuck in my head like that's it's the final countdown okay i have to stop others will charge me youtube will be like oh can't have volume because you saw that actually that might happen another thing about it. i hope i should do that anyway it's the final class of the semester well it's the final in-person class so that's the big key you know, I kind of tease a bunch of people not here. We still have four more classes. Um, they'll just all be over Zoom. We're now officially done with being in person. Next time I see you all, actually will see your beautiful smiling faces. Because um, uh, you won't have to mask in your own home or wherever you unless you're like taking this class in Starbucks or an airplane. I have had students, by the way, in class on plane. It happened last semester, in the spring semester, uh, Fall semester, excuse me, where, you know, it, I'm filming it was the beginning of the semester, and I think that student was coming to Phoenix, and um, it just looked like she was on a plane, and finally, at one time, I'm like, are those the little air conditioner, you guys know, the, you know, the AC things, you get their own little nozzle, it's like, and so I asked, and I, I forget her, what her name was, but I was like, you know, Amy, are, are you on a plane right now? And she laughs, and she kind of does one of this, she goes, uh-huh, and she puts my it's so cool. Like, that's dedication. You are 35,000 feet in the air, and yet you're still in class. I thought that was really cool. So you'll be able to obviously take a class from whatever. I will, of course, be teaching it from the comfort of my own living room um, in my growingly, my growingly uncomfortable chair. I bought a really cool gaming chair that was obviously really cheap because it's just breaking, and now it leans forward. So I have to, like, have the worst posture in the world to, to sit in it and, and suck. So... I also have a standing desk, so I don't just actually stand the whole class, too. So today's our last in-person class, um, and if you, by chance, didn't watch the first lecture, uh, which was the lead-up to World War One, today is World War I. Um, this is my absolute favorite war to study in history. Um, there's some fascinating wars, especially in American history, the Revolutionary War, Civil War, very, very, very interesting. World War One, though, on a you know worldwide scope, is fascinating to me because it really occurs during the convergence of old world technology, old world battlefield strategy, and then industrial, you know, the industrial world, kind of the modern world. Um, there, essentially, I mean, there's kind of some historical um, phrases towards they rode into that war on horseback. They rode out in tanks. They flew over the battlefield, shaking their, they started the war flying over the battlefield in balloons, shaking their fists. They ended in planes dropping bombs. Um, so this war took place in a time when industrially the world was in the midst of the industrial revolution and in the midst of this tremendous change 
and it just so happened um, to converge at a time where um, you know war was going to occur and end up leading to about 20 million senseless deaths. So today we're going to talk about the war. We discussed the lead up to it in the first lecture, and today we're going to talk about the actual war, like war itself. So, and I hope to make that as, as fast as possible. It's going to be interesting. I, I mean, I can promise you this, this is going to be just like boring drudgery. I also don't talk strategy. Battlefield strategy is completely irrelevant to us um, in any war. So like I, in my U.S. history this week and next week, I teach the American Civil War. And I tell the kids straightforward, battlefield strategy and war strategy is entirely irrelevant. It means nothing to you. What is important are those big political and social events that occurred that changed our lives. And in the case of the Civil War, changed our lives 150 years before we were born. In the case of the Civil War, in the case of World War I, excuse me, 100 years before, before we were born. Um, in fact, if those wars don't occur, we might not even exist. Think about all the dead Americans, over 650,000 dead Americans. Think about all the dead people around the world in World War I, over 20 million. Imagine if all those people had lived, all the breeding that would have occurred, that couldn't because those lives were snuffed out. That would mean so many more people on this planet for people to meet and, and have families with that might literally genetically change the, the face of history. So without those deaths, none of us exist. So we almost need those deaths for us to live. Um, so you kind of, when you look at the war from that perspective, forget the battlefield strategy. If you think about those deaths need to occur for me to live, for me to exist, I think that alone should make any discussion uh, in terms of the war interesting and fascinating because you're actually looking at a couple of gen just really two generations, maybe three generations before you were born. If you think about seven thousand years ago, we needed those wars to occur for us to, to live as well. But we're not talking hundreds, you know, dozens to hundreds of generations. It's hard to really connect. But in case of this, we're talking about my great grandparents. For you guys, you're just talking about your great great grandparents. That's not too many generations off. So and we needed people to die for us to be here. So uh, enough setup. Oh, we're gonna thumbs up. Enough setup, we've got a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, oh, that's the wrong spot. So if uh, if you didn't watch the, the Tuesday lecture for some reason, first off, shame on you. It was a fantastic lecture. It's actually, it's actually also missed instructions for the rest of this semester. We have one assignment left and it's a very straightforward and easy assignment, half of which you can complete right now. No questions asked. You can literally look it over. There's four questions and a couple of them with the part A, part B. And you can answer them right now as we speak without ever seeing these lectures. Um, and so the semester technically ends on Sunday, April 18th. Loud Cloud will close on Sunday, April 18th at, at midnight. So if you wait until midnight on the 19th to turn something in, I cannot, it won't accept, it won't go through, the, the, the grade book is locked. And in fact, you will have your final grade no matter what by midnight that night. I have a habit of staying up, waiting until midnight, and then finishing all of the grade. The thing though is that you can have, and I'm imploring you to, to do this as I'm about to um, present to you, you can have your grade, mm -hmm. final grade, by the 13th. That's less than two weeks from now, you will know your final grade, not for that assignment, not just for that assignment, before this class is over. We will be at a thousand points on this day. So the semester technically ends the 18th. Technically, you can turn in your final assignment there, but that is three weeks. That is longer than any other assignment, and it's not a harder assignment. It's just because we have a finals week that we normally you know, we don't have attached to the rest of the schedule. You will only need two weeks, probably only need two days, honestly, to get this thing done. I mean, truthfully, you can sit down and pound this out in like two hours. Um, but you only need two weeks to get it done. So if I were to talk about the past is World War I, today we're going to talk about World War I. Next week, we're going to do the prelude to World War II, and then we're going to talk about World War II. And then our lecture series ends. And then what I'm asking you is we're going to have a live class and be able to resume. So obviously, in person, in person, Zoom, 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 Zoom. Our uh, April 13th class will be over Zoom. But what I'm going to ask you to have, it, have for that day is have your assignment complete, which you'll have two weeks to do. It's more than enough time. It's a very, very straightforward we'll discussion assignment as you're in the second. You can absolutely and unequivocally get it done. I'm going to ask you to have it done or finish it in class. Um, so in the time we're supposed to be in class. Because so what we'll do is we'll all sign in. It's a four-credit class on the 13th. 
and the first person in line who has their assignment turned in, I will grade. I will grade that assignment right there in front of you. So when we're on Zoom, I'll pull you aside, do one of those kind of sidebar meetings. I will grade the assignment right there in front of you. You will get your grade on assignment plus your participation for that day, and you will get your final grade out of 1,000 points right then and there. Within about five minutes, you will know what your final grade is, and then you'll be done. I'll say, okay, thank you. You know, I had a great time. I love you all. I love you. you know, teach your student away. And you'll be able to log up, and then you're done. The next person will have their grade in about 10 minutes and so forth. I, mean, I, I give about five minutes per, although it could be a little bit less. And that's it. And then you leave. Then by the end of that class, if you have that thing turned in, you will know your final grade, and you can forget this class for the rest of the week. And you can take this time, the rest of the 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, to focus on two, three, four of the classes you've got, finals and, and final assignments that aren't due until this day. But if you have it done here, you'll have your final grade. Furthermore, this is the last time I can help you. And the thing is, I want to be able to help you. If you wait until after the 13th, certainly if you wait to the 18th, and you do something wrong, I have to take points off, as I always would. And I can't help you and be like, you know, hey, here's the issue. Let me re, uh, reassign it to you, fix it, and then turn it back in for full credit. I will do that right here. And that's part of the beauty of this class, particular class, is that if you did something wrong, let's say I have to take off 25 points. You know, 20 points away from a B plus, you know, or, or an A minus kind of thing. You're on a B plus, 20 points away from an A minus. I will reassign it to you and say, okay, get it right, fix it. And you can either fix it in class, or if it takes a little longer, turn it on the 14th or 15th. Then it will regrade it, even those points, boom, you just look up that next grade. If you wait until a state, I can't. And actually, if really, if you wait until after the state, I can't, because it's going to be a lot more difficult to get a hold of me, because I've got four, you know, four classes, and the grading a ton, it's just going to be a lot more, it, it, I'll be a little bit slower to try to get to it. But if you take these next two weeks to get done at the 13th, and you get it wrong, you get something wrong, I can reassign it, reassign it to you, and then grade it by the 15th, and be done. And either way, you're finished. Now, I'll tell you this. The university wants you to have it until the 18th. Fine, I will accept on the 18th, but I'm not going to penalize you for that. I'm asking you to have it done on the 13th because I can help you out to get your final grade. But I have, I will accept it up to the 18th. The thing is, if you have my word on this, every single semester, I have literally between three and five students. Now I have over 150 students, but I have literally three or five students who will wait until midnight on the 18th to turn in this assignment. And they'll try to turn it in at like 12.01 or 12.15. Last semester, I literally had a student texting me at 1.30 going, I'm trying to turn it in, it won't. The lab cloud locks the moment we get into the 19th. I can't reopen it, you get a zero. So if you really do wait to the last second, you don't start this assignment until like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on the 18th. It's going to take you some time. It's not a hard assignment, then I'll show it to you in a second. But then all of a sudden, you turn it up, half-assed assignment, or it's half done, or you try, to, you try to turn it in after the clock turns to midnight, it is over. I can't help you. And every single semester, between three and five students who, after midnight, shoot me texts, friends, they're going, I can't turn it in, I can't turn it in, it's done, it's done, it's done. Too late. Not only did I ask you to get it done in two weeks, but you actually had three weeks to get it done, and you waited still until the last second? I can't over. It's over. I've had students fail my class because of that. You know, it's 100% their fault. They failed my class. I've had students drop from a B to a C or a C to a D because of that. Because it's you know, you really waited until the 19th to turn it in when you had three weeks to finish it. So don't be that person. You got two weeks to do something. It'll probably just take you a couple of hours. Turn it in on the 13th. If you do something wrong, I will reassign. I will tell you exactly what the problem is. I will reassign it to you right then and there. Then you'll have it until the 18th to turn it in, but then I ask you to just get it done by like the 15th. I will hold a Zoom, but it won't be mandatory. I will still hold class. I will be doing something for the class, but it just won't be a mandatory class. This one is for points. Um, but then, like, if the person does turn it, you know, I reassign it, I do turn it, I'll be right there. I'll grade it in front of you and I'll help you out anything too. If you wait any later, though, I can't tell you. Cool? Does that all make sense? What day are we turning it in? The 13th. You have 12 days. 12 days to do this. This is very strange. Sorry. Ooh, that's terrible. Uh, here. I can make this look
Uh, oh, there we, yeah, there was some coming up. So, this is a very straightforward sum. Again, it's four questions, but two of them the exact same question, just twice. So, using this part sheet, and, so, and using only kind of 150, 200 words, that is barely an essay text. Those are such small responses. How would science, number one, how would science, technology, the environment, disease influence how society is developed? 150, 200 questions. We've kind of discussed that all semester. How would science, technology, the environment, disease influence how society is developed? Then, number two, describe and summarize the historical events below. This is A and B. Include the years the events occurred. So, describe and summarize the Euro European expansion around the globe. 150, 200 words, piece of cake. And then, the rise of the, uh, describe and summarize the rise of the modern world, include what events marked the start of the modern world. 150, 200 words. Boom. And all I have to do is just pick. So now, this is totally opinion based. When did the modern world begin? You could say, 1776. You could say 1980. You could say 1945 with the drop of nuclear bomb, or, or you know, with the development of nuclear You could pick another date in history. When did the modern world begin? You pick the time, so you have to include the years of the events expansion, include the years of the European expansion on the globe, and explain when the rise of the modern world occurred, and summarize what that was. You could do this right now. Piece of cake. Then, number three and four are based directly off of this, and that's it. Then provide your top 10 scientific discoveries, technological advancements, environmental occurrences, and medical or disease-related discoveries, innovations, or events relating to A, the expansion of Europe around the globe during the years that you included in your answer. You pick the top 10 events you know, top tech discovery, scientific discoveries, technological advancements, environmental occurrences, medical discoveries, innovations, events, yada yada, that occurred at this. That's it. And then looking at your top 10 list, how do these all play a role in the European expansion around the globe? Then number four is number is just like number three, only it's just for B. Your top 10, your list of top 10 important scientific discoveries, technological advancements, environmental occurrences, medical disease related discoveries, innovations, or events. Related to the rise of the modern world, and then B, looking at your top 10 list, how did these all play a role in the rise of the modern world? You're done. That's it. It's a piece of cake. You can do, if, if you go today and decide when was the rise of the modern world, pick a date, use the textbook, research it, like just in your mind, go, that seems like when the world really changed, became kind of the world that I know it. Boom. You can then go back into these right there. Now, I've discussed a lot of this in the textbook, excuse me, in the lectures. So you can go back and just kind of sift through and go, okay, you know, that was a big thing, that was a big thing. Textbook obviously has a ton of stuff, and you can use the internet. The only thing you cannot cite like normal is encyclopedias, dictionaries. It's got to be like scholarly sources. You got to be able to see citations. You know, that's kind of what makes it scholarly. So it's going, okay, here's my argument, here's all my proof. That is acceptable. But really, I would start kind of here, answer one or two, just in your, settle on your mind, what are those the dates, you know, that just kind of define European expansion of the rise of the world. And then top 10 events, I mean, I'm, look, I'm looking for things. You don't have to provide a paragraph for each. You're looking like a thing, you know, the development of nuclear bomb. Okay, cool. That's a sentence. Or that's, you know, that's your answer. Although it would have to be able to assume. So the development of nuclear bomb. Okay, cool. Just answer your top 10, and then just explain why your top list, the top 10 list, all played a role in you know, either European expansion, the whole long world. You're finished. You guys, this is a couple hours. That's that's really it. And so much of this is purely opinion. Yeah. Yeah, so read it, put your citations in B. Okay, no, that would be that would just be so awkward. And the thing is. Again, it's opinion, so rise of it. So I mean, if you were to include a nuclear bomb, what are you going to cite? It, you know, it's it, when you explain how do these play a role, 
And either that's where you'll provide citations. You don't have to have 10 citations. You have to you know, just give me a couple. Of just this is what I kind of know. Yeah. Make sense? You guys, that'll take you a couple hours. You've got 12 days. One, if you st let's say we start today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven. 12. You have 13 days. How about another 13? Oh, I should have known that first 13. Sorry. Have another 13. And if you do have it done on the 13th or in class on the 13th, you will leave that Zoom meeting with your 1,000-point score for the semester. And then you don't have to look back at this class again. You're going to spend the next five days focusing on two, three, four of the classes, get those grades up, and do, you know, get that done. Focus on those. Because you'll be like, hey, I've done a world history. That class is finished. And be done. And enjoy your summer. Cool? Does that everybody understand? Who loves you? Jesus. Yeah. I'm number two. Uh, all right. So if you missed the first lecture, first off, shame on you. It was a fantastic lecture. I nailed it. The best lecture. Of the oh, did you watch it? Oh, you're the man. I nailed it. Yeah, no, I did. Again, I love World War One. It's so fascinating. So I just I had a lot of fun discussing this. And I mean, I had some great, I think, I think. I had some really good questions that really were, were kind of fun about. Don't worry, I've got questions in here. I want to know. But if somebody were to ask you, and I kind of teased this, don't I? But, you know, what was the cause of World War One? That. There is no straightforward answer. There are answers. There are reasons that World War One existed. But the thing, though, is that it is such a convoluted, complex, like, it's almost one of those, like, you look back and go, no, really. How did that happen? Why did this happen? Because on paper, World War I, the way it unrolled and unveiled and the, the, the massive death that occurred, it should have never happened. I mean, if, if somebody would ever ask, we're going to go and take a you know, master's class in history and they're going to talk about World War I, literally, the, the, the reasons that should be cited as why World War I should exist is like, I don't know. You know, it's just one of those things where you, you look back, and you're like, hey, how many of you guys, okay, let me ask this. Let's make the past the present. My problem. How many of you guys have gotten in a fight with like a sibling or a cousin or you know one of your best friends? And at the end of that fight, and I hopefully don't get brawl, I mean you're like yell at you're mad at each other. And at the end of that argument, you kind of look back and go, how did that happen? Like, we went from zero to sixty. Like that, you're like, okay, no, I won, or I lost, or that was terrible, or maybe you just lost a friend, or maybe your sister just ticked off with you for a while. Okay. But you look back at that argument and go, how the hell happened? Like, what is this? Often relationships, those those things kind of happen all the time, right? Like, you're in a relationship, you wake up one morning, you totally love your significant other, but the end of the day, like, that person's a jerk. And you kind of think back on a day and go, oh, that's kind of this. People look back at the after this war, you know, almost a little drunk on, did we really just have a five-year war? Like, where did that come from? It's so convoluted. It makes sense. It's just so complicated. It's like a spider web where you're trying to find the way to the middle, and you almost can't. So connecting the causes. I mean, this is, again, if you did watch this in a little bit, I'll just do a little bit of uh, review. How could one assassination lead to an all-out world war of ever proportions in a little just a couple weeks? I went through a timeline, you guys. It took 50 days from the assassination of Franz Ferdinand to Germany invading Russia. Germany and Russia didn't like each other, but they were 50 days before, by no means on the verge of invasion. And yet 50 days after the assassination of the Archduke of uh, well, or, excuse me, Archduke of Franz Ferdinand, all of a sudden there's Germany invading Russia. It's like, what? You know, it was 27 days, I believe, after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand that England dropped off 150,000 soldiers into France right in the fight. They were, four weeks earlier, those guys were all planning a great summer vacation. And yet there they were on summer vacation as soldiers in France waiting to die. It took 27 days. It just really unraveled so quickly that Men had to have looked around at each other one day on the battlefield going, how the hell did we get here? So how did it happen? One, sorry for saying, 
the way I said that. But it kind of them, that's a little bit different. No. So number one is the alliance system. Each country had a commitment to each country to participate or had commitments to uh, the other. Once more was declared, it was kind of like, oh, you're at war, but now we're at war on your behalf. We've got your back. And a lot of people just had each other's backs. Number two was nationalism. Russia and Serbia saw Austria Hungary as oppressors of Slavic peoples. And as soon as they were in this fight, they were in it to the end. They were looking for independence, essentially. For some people, this was independence. Number three was imperialism. Each country, through by imperialist desires, had to maintain and defend their power and work. They were afraid if I don't fight, I will be knocked down a few steps. There were there were certain world powers in play here that no longer exist who thought if we don't fight, we'll drop down the list. Well, unfortunately for them, unfortunately for others, they by losing, they disappeared or severely damaged. But they all had an ego and a desire to remain kind of one of those world powers that they kind of forced them to fight. And number four is militarism, which really ties into two and three. And as once the guns began firing, it was impossible to stop. Because if you stopped, not only, and if you said, okay, I give up, not only would you lose your status as a world power, but then, well, okay, so not only would you lose your status as a world power, but then you would lose all of your imperialist gains to travel the world, the victors were just kind of pillage. Uh, so, I mean, again, imagine that fight that you had with your sister or sibling you know, or cousin or whatever, and by losing, you lost the video game system, you lost your stereo system, you lost your TV. You know, if you had to keep fighting in order to keep your stuff, well, it's essentially this. If they stopped fighting, if somebody stopped fighting, they were going to lose all their stuff, and nobody wanted to lose it. So this is what Europe looked like before World War One: Germany, Austria, Hungary, Romania, Serbia, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire of Turkey. Kind of goes into this area. Today, and then Russia like really reached in pretty deep into Eastern Europe. Today, because of World War One and then events afterwards, the war looks, <laughs> the, the, the European map looks nothing like this. So who are the two sides with the boxers on the other side of the corner? Well, the triple alliance was Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And by the way, when this world started, when this, world, when this war started, both sides kind of looked at Italy and was like, hey, they're kind of my side, they're really my side. And because of alliances, uh, Italy sided with Germany and Austria, Hungary. And then the triple entente, which was originally France, Russia, and Great Britain. But then eventually when the United States joined, they joined over here. All right, so I refer to what's say Define war. Oh, this isn't a what's say I'm just telling the answer. I should have asked you before. What is war? War is exercises in violence when diplomacy fails and statesmen, politicians, and bureaucrats hand over to soldiers the burden of achieving victory. Remember that soldiers are at the behest of their governments. They are extensions of federal governments. They are paid by the federal government. They're controlled by the federal government. And it is the president or king who is in control of their lives, in essence, by telling them where to fight, when to fight, who to fight. The soldiers don't get to choose any of them. Officers and generals, they kind of get to decide the strategy. But a general cannot declare war. The governments have to. The government's controlling the generals. And so war is the exercise of violence when the presidents and the kings uh, can no longer achieve you know, victory diplomatically, meaning you know, in a boardroom behind the desk, you know, debating, discussing, writing. It's okay, we've got no other choice but to fight. And essentially it's okay, citizens, you're fighting for our cause. Now, governments have to convince their people, and certainly the soldiers, hey, this is worth dying for. Your life is, is worth less than the whole. Um, but in the end, this all war is, is a government failing to succeed in their desires. Now, it's one thing if you elected your government, if the government was democratically selected, if you voted for it. Because now, it's, you know, your, electric, your elected officials are truly representing your own ideals. It's wholly another, though, when your government was unelected, when they were born into it, 
Well, I'm a king. I was born a king. Well, my son is the next king, and they are in charge of tens of millions of people. Think about that. It's one thing for the United States to enter war because we elected our presidents. We elect our presidents, excuse me. They, they really are supposed to have our best interests in mind because we place them there with our best interests in mind. We can vote them out, you know, that kind of thing. They really have to think about what do the people want because otherwise I'll lose my power. It's not the same with kings. Back then, when kings got mad at each other, they weren't just individual rivalries. It was like two neighbors getting ticked off and then hiring. So it'd be like me and my next door neighbor getting mad at each other. And then he and I hiring people from around the block to go kill each other in our behalves. That sucks. I mean, that really sucks. Those people don't have a choice in their leadership. That really changes things, doesn't it? Kind of think about well, war and certainly the role of the soldiers. That changes a whole lot. What the heck am I fighting for? I didn't vote for you. These people had pride, but they didn't have a choice. Huge, huge differences there. Um, so, again, strategies I don't care about, so I'm going to apply to a lot of this, but it is certainly important. So, there was general jubilation when war started. War at this time in history, very odd to us, was celebrated. It was seen as a way for nations to gain uh, you know, a foothold of power around the world. Everybody wanted to be number one. Today in the United States, we have so many Americans who are like, oh, let's knock down to 30 in the world. You know, There was a time where we wanted to be number one, too. Um, and at this time, everybody wanted to be number one, and they're willing to fight for it. Plus, it was a very honorable thing, certainly for men. When men returned from battle, they were seen as conquering, especially when they're successful. They were seen as conquering heroes, scars, battle wounds, those kinds of things. Those were those were signs that these that, they, that uh, boys prior to war came home men. So uh, Teddy Roosevelt even said at this time that it was necessary for every generation of, of boys to fight in the war so that they could enter the uh, you know enter society as men. Um, so, I mean, that was really how people looked at it. So when, when this war broke out, it was met with celebration on all sides. We're going to conquer you. We're going to come out stronger and bigger and better and the whole world will know it. Unfortunately, the horrors of modern warfare were not yet understood. Again, they, the, the old phrase they wrote in on horseback and they wrote out in tanks. Prior to this war, if you shot a gun, you had one shot. When this war started, the Germans were able to, the Germans had machine guns that could shoot 100 bullets a second. I mean, these things were just mowing human beings down by the thousands in a matter of seconds. People were no longer jubilant, you know, jubilant when they realized, I am going to die. It wasn't just, I might die. For a lot of these guys, when an officer said, charge, and they went, they left their, their bunker and they went over the top. They knew they were dead. There was no, I might survive. I'm going to go kill myself, you know, a, a German or something. It was, no, I've got minutes left in my life. Charge, I might have seconds. They might literally get 10 feet from over the top, and the Germans had mowed them down, <clears throat> cut them in half. So for Germans in particular, the memory of Otto von Bismarck's swift, decisive wars were getting mind And the Germans thought, we got this war. We're going to win so, so bad on quick. But both sides, as in the Triple Alliance, the Triple Entente, both sides believe that they would have a quick offensive victory. Both sides, this war's going to be over in a couple of months. We're all going to come home with our bad stars. So just say, oh, I trained, I was a soldier, and, and be treated like, you know, Greek gods. Alfred von Schieffler, however, was the architect of the German plan. And his goal at first was to prevent the two front war. He was going to fight the French and English on the Western Front, and he was going to have the, the Germans on his Eastern Front. So his goal was to quickly outflank, uh, outflank the French by sweeping through Belgium, destroy France, and then once that's conquered, then turn and fight the, German, uh, the, the Russians excuse me, on the East. So his goal was to stand on the defense of the East until Russia, against Russia until France had been beaten, and then move all those soldiers to the East, destroy Russia, and boom, war is going to over. I mean, Ten elegant plan if it works. The problem, though, is that the plan failed when had too many troops assigned to the Eastern Front to hold it. The Russians started beating them back. The Russians then are able to invade Germany, and now they're playing defense at home while they're trying to win an offensive war in France, and it just became a quagmire real quick. 
So again, I don't get a strategy. This is all irrelevant to us, but just in terms of why did it fail, that was essentially it. It just failed to be able to hold off the Russians. The Russians pushed into Germany, and then um, and then while the Germans were trying to destroy France, they couldn't. It became a quagmire over here. So this was the plan. The thought was, okay, five armies were going to sweep through France, and I'm head to the east, and boom, win this war quickly. Instead, those are the battle lines. And they pretty much did not move from the time the war started to the time the war ended. You can see, so here's the Germans trying to push southwest into France. The Germans thought, again, we're going to sweep through here and then move this way. Instead, they got to this point. That's as far into France as ever got this green line. When the war ended, it ended right here. Those are the lines. They, this was a four and a half year war over one stretch of land. That was almost it. And it was a point out your war of 20 million dead. It was horrible. So here's a couple of images. This guy's literally just been shot. He's, it's one of those, like, he's about to collapse dead. It's kind of, I, I hate to kind of trivialize, but, you know, here's these guys, are the Germans, just fighting with machine guns. This is a guy heading this direction. Boom, he made it that far. Didn't make it. Here, more images, or another image of soldiers in trenches, so on and so forth. So, we also all know, so I can kind of fly through it, what, the, what trench warfare was. I'm going to show you a couple very short videos, so you can see it's going to be total six and a half minutes. Um, but, while trench warfare, that is digging a hole and, and kind of protecting yourself or firing over it to give yourself, you know, five, six feet of protection. While that strategy had existed for hundreds of years, World War I was not the first war to utilize trench warfare. This was the war in which it became almost a strategic necessity to dig trenches. And the reason was simple. They say, this is anecdotal, but they say the reason that trench warfare became the name of the game of this, uh, in this war, was because the Germans had their machine guns. When the war started, the Germans set up these machine guns that were about three feet above ground on these tripods, and they literally would just like yell on the ground and then do one of these. And again, they're shooting up. 100, like 100 bullets a second. These things are just rounded up. And then they had thousands of them along with a single line. The French and British, when they all charged, they'd come running up the machine gun turrets and it just get wiped out. Literally, the French lost 250,000 soldiers in the first month. They were losing nearly 10,000 soldiers dead, not injured, dead a day. 10,000 a day when the Germans invaded France. And they said the reason trench warfare started is because these men were just running on this open battlefield, being mowed down. They couldn't get any close because it was just a shower, a hail of bullets coming at them. The French and British soldiers just dropped to the ground, get below the three foot line, and just start clawing on the ground to avoid these bullets which are above their head. So that's, they say, again, it's dead dog, they said it's why the trenches started. These guys are literally just digging, desperate, knowing that. He turned his face on the face, desperately digging to get on the ground because that hail of bullets was at waist high. So let's just check out what these were like. Again, about two or three close, this is short. Hopefully, people watching online hear it well. Sorry, we should be able to hear well. At Safe Light Auto Glass, we're committed to taking care of you and your car. Whether you're here, I can't believe I'm not. <laughs> By the way, is it just me, or has YouTube gone way over the top with commercials since COVID started? It's like unbelievable how many commercials they have now. It all started because of COVID. A few months after COVID started, I recognized, because I watch YouTube every day, uh, I recognized the commercials just skyrocketed by tenfold. And a couple weeks into it, maybe it was a couple months, I got a poll from YouTube that said, and it didn't mention commercials. It just asked, has your experience on YouTube gotten worse, gotten better, or stayed the same? And I was like, it has absolutely gotten worse. <laughs> I'm like, it's all your bloody commercials that just don't stop. Ah, uh, great. <laughs> Life in a trench, I like to explain in one word horrific. It's mud, it's death, it's grass, it's stench, and soldiers develop an attitude in the trench that everybody 
is going to die. Life in the trench told you was abysmal. There were several lines of trenches, and the front line trenches, of course, were the most dangerous because they were constantly under fire. The Germans dug exigency, building dry, safe, and comfortable trenches for themselves with bunkers that actually had electricity and sometimes running water. The British and French, who were convinced that they were never going to be there for that long, didn't spend nearly the same effort. So their trenches tended to be muddy and wet and not that safe. Disease ran rampant. It was very difficult to get any sort of sleep, a decent hot meal, keep your clothes dry, and more importantly, keep your sanity. There were so many health problems, uh, just simple disease, that took much more men on combat than direct fire. I think one word that would surprise people about life in a trench, boredom. A lot of time is spent just sitting, cleaning tools, and being scared to death about a snowstorm in bed. It was just the day to day monotony, being trapped in this very small space, and fighting for a war that's really fought in inches. The idea of open warfare, of fighting out into what they call no man's land, wasn't working. Technology of the war had advanced so much with machine guns, artillery that could lob shells a mile. It became mostly a defensive war early on. And as a defensive war, you wanted to protect your troops. So the miles and miles of trenches were built. There were often bodies buried in sides of trenches, bodies lying out in the open in front of the trenches. The soldiers were experiencing not only the war that they were fighting in the moment. But the war that had been going on throughout those trenches for all of the years of the war. A young lieutenant writes his mother and says, I haven't been killed yet. It's only a matter of time. That's typical of the way soldiers felt about life in the trench. You just did. You existed day to day, tried to go on, keep your chin up. But one day, what was going to have their name on it? You were going to perish. You weren't going to Really, there, there really was no other. Well, oh, okay, I take it back. I was going to say there really was no other war in which that was kind of a, a, a you know a guarantee, and certainly it wasn't guarantee. It's not like one hundred percent of soldiers did. You know, were enlisted or fought, died. But there were definitely certain instances where soldiers were so close to the front, and they knew that that a battle was coming. And they, and for the French in particular, those generals treated their soldiers like, I mean, they were just ratty t-shirts. Every one, um, there there were some generals that, that just just attempted the same thing, the same failure of strategy, time and time and time and time again. Where soldiers say, okay, well, as soon as this General says, charge, I'm dead. And they just knew, okay, so tomorrow at 6 a.m. the battle starts, I'd go over the, the top and I'll be dead by 6.15. So they would just go to sleep that night if they could, or you know, they just some of them were, were just so kind of in shock or, or had become so, um, what would be the word, just resolved with their own death coming. And they kind of knew what time was coming. They, they might just, you know, just could actually fall asleep that night. They, here and their officers at 5 a.m. But okay, I'm gonna get up, have a, have a meal, we're gonna go on top in an hour, and that was it. They just said, okay, well, I'm dead in an hour. And they could kind of count down the minutes, count down the seconds. So as they say, charge for kids, run, and just try to dodge bullets. But there were thousands of them flying at you, and eventually one was gonna clip you on the brain, and one was gonna clip you on the heart, you know, the, the gut. And then that battle wasn't gonna end just because we were laying there, it was gonna just keep raging while the bottles just piled up on top of them. So it was, it was so bad. It was so bad. I think one really clear way of understanding the shift in World War I in terms of technology is that soldiers rode in on horses and they left in the airplanes. At the beginning of World War I, warfare is almost in the 19th century style. The French sincerely believe that 
going at the troops with determination and enemy troops is the way to go. What they don't understand is the collision of technologies. General Murphy didn't believe in the trench warfare. He grew up on the plains fighting in Indian warfare where it was an open time of tradition. So he trained his troops to fight in the open warfare. The British and French generals thought he was crazy. They criticized him for this. It's impossible to cross that deadly beaten zone, the deadly zone between the two lines. The most determined line of soldiers cannot oppose a machine gun that fires hundreds of rounds a minute. World War I wasn't just the first industrial war, it was also the first scientific war. For the first time that societies had taken all of their resources of science and intelligence and said, how do we do this better? How do we fight better? How do we develop technologies? A lot of the armaments you see in World War I had been used before. Submarines, trench warfare, Gatling guns, machine guns. What happens during World War I is that these become mature and these become even more destructive. During the war, the governments of all the different foreign powers put enormous amounts of time and effort into scientific and technical development. So that the advancements which would have happened anyway happen at a much more rapid pace, and they happen according to the priorities of the foreign powers. Something happened in trench warfare that changed the course of the war and changed the way we understand warfare today, and that's how. The first gas attack, it was at a place called Vimy Ridge, and it was mostly Canadian soldiers who were being attacked. And the Canadian soldiers who were in the trenches saw this cloud of haze coming towards them. They had no gas masks, they had no equipment to protect them. Chlorine gas causes your lungs to fill with liquid, and so essentially you drown from the inside out. It was really the first war in which all of the technologies and science and industry of the 19th century were put to the sole purpose of killing people. I just heard it. Sounds like fun, right? Nobody? Yeah. One down, but so there are so good at digging. Go over. Did they ever try to build like tunnels underneath? Oh yeah. Uh, do I have? I don't know if I discussed that in here. But yes. So they didn't necessarily build tunnels underneath to move soldiers, but they did build tunnels underneath to blow up opposite trenches. Um, so they and uh, both sides attempted doing this, and were aware that the other, you know, their opponents were doing that to the point where they actually had people with with stethoscopes. Listening to the ground, just listening for clinking and, and digging and that kind of thing, because then they would know to, to kind of dig in that direction and, and blow them up. Um, so they would do it often by hand, you know, once they would get close to the opposition trench. You know, so if a trench is six feet deep, they're trying to go 20 feet below. Um, they would get to the point where they were literally like kind of digging by hand to be as absolutely quiet as possible. They would move bombs and munitions under. And they would kind of skirt it all the way back and pull, you know, hit the button, pull them up. So that happened on occasion. There was one uh, British explosion underneath German trenches that, that was that took like a year of of digging and placing. That um, was so huge and extensive that the explosion itself, you know, while in France, the explosion itself was heard from England, which is you know across all of France, across the English Channel, and on the English island, that it, it, it was so big, it was heard, it felt. Uh, and so it was planned, they had scheduled, okay, we're gonna you know, hit that button on May 1st at 6 a.m., and then we're gonna charge and take him out. And it didn't end up, I mean, the explosion was horrendous. They said just bodies and body parts just went flying in the sky, you know, for hundreds of yards. It was, it was a huge, huge, huge explosion. And they went and charged, and then got pushed back. You know, it just did like there was still plenty more, you know, soldiers behind them. And uh, but no, they, they did that quite regularly. Some of them, it didn't look like any of the explosions in that video were from 
mines, they look like they were bombs. But you know, when they went and they when those mines went up, them just it would it look like a nuclear blast if they're you know really. So they, they did that regularly. It just again and in the end it just held them all. Oh, is it? It just held them all right here. I mean, this swath of land, it just fought over this swath of land for four and a half years. It just couldn't make neither side would just push through. Uh, so what did the trenches look like? Um, so, or how did you know the, the whole organization of battlefield look like? So no man's land in a stretch of land in between both sides trenches. It was called no man's land because nobody had control of control of those girl land. Um, and then you would have barbed wire, because you know, we didn't want to be open, we wanted to slow down your opposition. So barbed wire there were meters deep, you know, and an impassable obstacle for any troop attempting to reach the other side. Then you'd have your front line dug out to provide some protection against that uh, uh, shell. Then you'd move back to the next line, you'd have a support trench, you'd have your concrete blockhouse for machine guns. Um, these were called pillboxes too. Um, and this is then where you might have a deeper dugout for Germans, particularly, they'd be about 15 meters below. So we're looking at about 18, 20 feet. Uh, and very well constructed to be damaged, too uh, well constructed to be damaged by shell fire. So they would, these, some of these officers would live in these range of areas, of course they're underground, so it's, it sucks. But their uh, comfort of living was far better than any soldiers up in the front lines. And in the back, you have your reserve trench, communications trenches, and so forth. And then even behind, farther behind that, you have your, your long range artillery that would just bombard the entire time until you know, an officer would be able to charge. So, just kind of a side view again, the, the Germans, if you did put boards on that any water from rain would seep down to the lower trench and need to stay dry. And again, as they were saying, the Germans took this very seriously. They recognized you know, the advantages of having like, really good trenches built. So, even though you're on living, Dark and smaller, there was different variations of, of cleanliness, you know, or of organization living. So Germans did quite well. And there are stories of French and British when they would charge they would take German trenches, they were like, we're living in luxury here by comparison, because the French and the English just now would change at the time. But certainly initially, the French and the English in their trenches were literally just holes in the mud, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the duck boards were really the most important part, and it would have been the most um, uh, luxurious aspect, and the part that really saved a lot of guys from getting sick. And that's because water, um, when you're constantly wet, you know how your skin gets really, you get the, the, what do they call the raise of fingers, you know, if you're in the shower salon and that kind of thing. Well, now imagine on your body, your, your skin does start to thin out uh, when you're in water, when you're wet too long. Um, and then it leaves you open to disease. And so, and not only that, it's also horribly uncomfortable. If you ever walked around in, in wet shoes, it just felt gross and squishy. Imagine never being able to stop that. It just it feels extraordinarily uncomfortable. And then your feet get um, very, the skin gets very thin, become more open to disease, and then you start to develop like a grain and all this stuff, which is extremely um, uncomfortable um, and then very dangerous. Game grain can kill you. Um, and so, if they didn't have duck boards to keep the water from, from rain, from underground kind of springs and stuff um, below them, then it was it was a very uh, unhealthy and unsanitary living condition. It was extremely unhealthy and unsanitary anyway, but that alone provided them with some protection that just, while seemingly um, simple and small, was quite important. Here are a few other images. This is that no man's land, so back here. That's what those lines would look like. So this guy probably didn't die on the barbed wire. He probably died trying to cross it, probably shot, and just kind of slapped you over it. Um, but again, I mean, this would have been poor dugouts. That actually would have been the duck board right there, and these people beneath it. Uh, again, dead. All of these guys, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so in the course of the war, in terms of the Eastern Front, the Germans got about this far. This is the farthest advance in the summer of 1918. Remember, their hope was to swing through France like that and then come from this direction. But then on the French side, they could never get past this point. So here's all the French, or excuse me, here's the eastern side, and here's the, the French, the western side. So the development of the tank ended up being one of the most incredible roads. Like I said at the beginning, they rode in on horseback, they rode it out on in tanks. Um, so the inspiration of the tank actually came from farming equipment. 
um, tires couldn't get through the mud, and, and especially here, look at this car too. Notice all the craters. I mean, the car was going to ride on the stuff. You know, or anything on, on wheels is going to ride on the stuff. So that a horse or on a carriage, horses, those are going to get all mucked um, up. So tanks were actually an incredibly ingenious as before. I love this thing. This is just a big thing. Yeah, but it's, that is something a car could never do, but it's able to very slowly pull itself through based on the based on the ingenuity of the design of it. So the inspiration for the tank to get it over all of these extremely uneven swaths of land was the caterpillar tracks that were used for farming field. Um, the original tanks weighed about 28 tons, so that's 28 times 2,222, so we're talking about uh, almost 60,000 pounds for one tank. Um, they're 32, almost 33 feet long, they travel at three miles an hour. They were very, very slow, which also made them very easy targets to hit. But they were very well armored, so they could generally take a bullet. They weren't going to take a, a, a direct hit from a, a, a bomb or anything, per se. But And if they broke, if a caterpillar broke on one, they were just stranded. They were stuck there. And if they were in the middle of no man's land or the opposition to the side, they were kind of dead meat. But if they could survive and stay um, intact, then these things could be very, very helpful. It housed eight soldiers. So in this picture, we see one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, it would house eight soldiers for the control of the tank. That's not difficult to say for drive. Um, steering was extraordinarily difficult, but then also for communication, it was so loud in those tanks. So it took four people just to say, go here, go where, go here, go where, go here. Okay, I'll turn kind of thing. Uh, and then four others to shoot. So they would hold four shooters, which again, you have 10,000 was on the battlefield, they shoot four times, it was pretty effective. Um, England and France, by the end of the war, had produced over 7,000 of these tanks. Germany had only produced 21. So this was a, a tremendous advantage for the English and the French. Um, they, while they were decisive, they didn't necessarily try to force the war indefinitely. It really would take the United States for that to happen. Uh, but they were very, very helpful strategically. Uh, especially because they could lead a battle, kind of in the front line, and then have soldiers on foot come up from behind. Um, it was generally ineffective. They regularly broke down. This is brand new technology. Uh, but it certainly did help to kind of break lines and to allow soldiers to follow up behind. So, war in the West and in the sea. So, both sides turned west in 1916. Uh, again, the Basically, once the Germans realized we're never going to push through Russia, they signed an armistice with Russia to end the Eastern Front. They're like, okay, screw it, we're done. And then they were able to turn west and focus primarily on France. Uh, by the way, they didn't line up color cameras at the time, so these are colorized photos, but I do prefer color photos by the way. So in uh, February of 1916, we have the German offensive at Verdun, which is northern French town. Look how long that, that battle lasted. Ten months in one spot. Again, like I said, this is a war where battles were fought by over inches. Not miles. Inches. They could not look at stalemate after stalemate after just throw soldiers to the dead, throw soldiers to the dead, throw soldiers to the dead. Um, German casualties during this battle were between 300 and 400,000, including 143,000 dead. Just on one side of the ten months, it's about 10,000 a month. We're looking at a, a, a few hundred a day on average. Um, and by the way, we're just fighting continuously second after second, and there's times when we take days off and stuff and try to regroup and re strategize, which means when, they would, when the whistle would blow and go on top, you know, be 10,000 might die and get right there. French casualties were almost the same, about 380,000 dead, including the uh, like, injured uh, or, you know, the same I have been, including 163,000 confirmed dead. So we're talking about 300,000 soldiers confirmed dead in 10 months over both sides. It would end up being a French victory, but certainly because they helped the Germans out. The Germans could not overall take from them. Then came the Allied offensive at the Somme, which is another northern French city or town, um, and they had the superiority of the defensive side. So at the Somme, um, that started in July of 1916 and ended in November. This was also the first use of tanks. Um, Adolf Hitler 
fought on the Austrian side. Remember, he had no son, German per se, he was Austrian. He fought on the Austrian side, he was wounded. Uh, but he did not die. He actually could have died when a British soldier saved his life. Now, at this time, you know, Hitler was just a you know, really low ranking soldier. He was a nobody. Um, if he had died, he would have just been another one of those, you know, 125,000 dead. You know, we don't know any of the other 124,999. We know him because of his rise. So, this British soldier apparently absolutely just could have walked up and assassinated him. And it was on a battlefield, but he totally could have just killed him, just kind of got him on it, but he instead saved Hitler's life. Hitler was only a boy, like 19 years old. Hitler never forgot this man. He like he he kind of always had a little place in this guy's heart for not killing him. Or, or for at least not letting him die. Um, and in fact, years later, when Hitler rose to power, uh, this particular German, uh, this particular British guy uh, kind of did uh, an interview. I shouldn't say kind of was interviewed about him. He talked about, hey, I saved his life. Hitler actually supposedly cut out a newspaper article of this guy explaining the story, like had it saved off the side. It's like he was very, very appreciative that he let him live so that he could go and kill six million Jews. But I mean, at least, you know, on a one, one level, we had a little moment of humanity. So in the offense of uh, the offense of the song, 19,240 British soldiers died on the first day. In the first 24 hours on July 1st, almost 20,000 soldiers were dead, confirmed dead, with 57,000 casualties. That is one dead every 4.4 seconds. So we're talking. Um, that's how often somebody died. British just died on the battlefield in those first 20 parts. The French casualties were about 200,000 total, so 125,000 total dead in the course of those five months. French casualties, about 200,000. They didn't, for whatever reason, keep a record of how many were confirmed dead, but we know it's somewhere in this region because that German casualties, 465,000, including 125,000 dead. So we're probably at 250, we're probably at about 300, 325,000 dead on those three. Uh, so about 200,000, give or take, um, total between British and French in five months. This is I mean, they met us literally, okay, charge, die. Okay, let's all come back. We'll rebuild lives. Let's try to get a charge, die. Let's come back. Insanity. Their, their strategy is almost never changed. So at the sea, Germany probably said this. Germany um, imposed what we call unrestricted submarine warfare. Which meant they treated the Atlantic Ocean as a war zone and treated it as anybody that's in the Atlantic Ocean who does not have a German or Austria Hungarian or, Angera, or Italian flag, you are an enemy of us and thus you had to turn around and we blow you up. At first, the United States remained neutral. So technically, the Germans, like the Spanish, would allow a ship that had a United States American flag or a Spanish flag through because they were neutral, and that meant they weren't necessarily hurting the British. Unfortunately, over time, French and English ships started raising the American flag to pretend that they were American, pretend they were neutral. The Germans figured this out, like, well, we're gonna blow you up too. Um, so, which then made it more difficult for American flag, you know, flying ships to, to um, come to the Atlantic. So they set up this blockade on our strict submarine war flag there, and the Atlantic Ocean was controlled, controlled by the submarines that looked like this. These are the U boats, quite small, very, very, very tight quarters, um, but they had torpedoes and they could blow up really any sized ship that, that came, they came across. One of those ships, as you probably studied, is the Lusitania, which was sunk in 1915. We'll get into it here a little bit more in a second. This is the Lusitania right here, and I believe this is a colorized version of the, the Lusitania on its fateful trip. This is a picture of it leaving New York, heading for Ireland, um, and you know it would never make it, of course. And then here, this it was found in 95, I should have written it down, I forget, but this is a sonar of the Lusitania. So this is an like under, underwater part, those would have been more like the stacks, the steep stacks were, smoke stacks, excuse me. But this is it, and it's, Undersea grade. Do you guys know that the Titanic, they found the Titanic 30 years ago? Um, but within the last 15 years, 
Um, who is the director of the movie Titanic? James Cameron. James Cameron is a huge C buff and he's a huge Titanic buff. I mean, he didn't make that money, that movie Titanic, just because it was an interesting story. He made it kind of a love story to the Titanic. Uh, he led a group that tried, if you guys don't know, the Titanic actually broke in half and the two halves kind of settled about a mile and a half apart from one another. And they tried in the last few years to pull one of the halves up and actually designed these huge pulley systems to, to get it around it and pull it up and they intended on towing it to land, cleaning it up and putting it on display. Um, again, it's like five, 10 years ago. They got up and I believe the Titanic is about two and a half, three miles below the surface. They got it up about a mile, mile and a half, about almost halfway through, and the pulley system broke, and it came and went back down. So they're both still, maybe that was God saying, oh, no, you don't. But um, I'm kind of hoping, I hope that maybe we can at some point get it up. But then there was a guy who pre-pandemic was actually building Titanic 2, you guys heard about that one, where it's like a, an exact replica of the original Titanic with modern amendments. It's going to have to follow all modern laws in terms of um, life, life preservers and uh, lifeboats and modern sonar, all that stuff. But the ship itself, from a basic functional aspect, is going to look exactly like the original Titanic. I don't know what's happened to it because of the pandemic, but it's still going to be pretty cool. All right, so what got the United States in the world? So, like I said, the United States remained neutral, technical. We basically sided with the British and the French. I mean, think about the population. For the most part, those who are immigrant descent, the, the vast majority are from Muslim descent. But there are plenty of Italian descent, German descent, Austrian descent, and so on and so forth. So the United States officially were made neutral regarding the war, but their trade policies favored the allies of France, Britain, um, and so forth, and the Russians. German U boats patrol the Atlantic, like I said, and they were ready to attack even neutral merchant vessels without warning, uh, violating traditional wartime conventions. That is, you don't destroy neutral ships, but they're like, no, we're going to treat everybody who isn't flying a German or Russian flag as our enemy. Um, in 1915, they sunk the Lusitania, this ship right here. They sunk it, which was just, it was just a British cru cruise liner, because they believed that it was carrying munitions that when it docked to Ireland were going to be brought into the battle. It sunk, killing 1,198 of the 1,900 uh, they were on the ship, including 128 Americans. Um, so, unfortunately, it should have never been hit. It was its sinking was one of those events of truly of, of uh, being part of a series of truly unfortunate events. Um, essentially, the day before it was supposed to dock, it got caught in a fog, which was kind of normal. It was kind of traditional on the coast of the Atlantic, uh, coast of Europe. But they got caught in a fog, and obviously it didn't have modern technology. When they broke the fog, they the captain called for a maneuver that was fairly traditional to line up the ships and know exactly where it was by turning the ship sideways towards land, so that way you could get a direct view of a landmark, know exactly where they were, and then continue the trip. Well, the U-boat that sunk it was on its way home. It was done with its tour of the Atlantic, and so the region of sea that the Lusitania was in was supposed to be open, but this U-boat ended up being like a day late, and so it just happened to converge. Well, they put up the, the what's the spy glass thing? They, they put it up to the, to the surface, looked around, and went, there's a ship. Like, it was just there, and because it had turned, since it was a little off kilter because of the fog, because of the turn, it literally was basically doing this, shooting. So they did. Nobody knew on the ship when it was attended there was a U boat. But the U boat fired two torpedoes, one after another, both hit dead on. That thing sunk in minutes. Uh, I, I'll share it at the very end. There's a book called Dead Wake. It's the history of the Lusitania. Um, if you are a book reader, it's only about 250 uh, pages thick. And I say only because a lot of history books are much longer. It is extraordinarily well written. It does not read like a textbook. I swear to you, having read it, I couldn't put it down. It read like a movie script. Uh, this guy did an amazing job. It's a completely true story. 
um, every detail. He did such an amazing job of introducing and offering the details that it's, I swear to you, it reads like you're reading a movie, but they like a great story. Um, so I highly recommend it. I'll have it in the end. I just want to upload this to my notes. It's called Dead Weight. It is a fantastic book. It explains in tremendous detail. I swear to you, I'm not exaggerating. Because of this book, I feel like I can see the ship sinking. I feel like I can see the torpedoes coming because of how well it describes all those ones. I feel like I can hear the people screaming, people jumping over the edge, and all that stuff. So I just I highlight it. Everyone. It's, it's totally like a, a worthwhile summary. If you are a book reader, you'll get it done about two grades. Like, it, it'll fly through it because you won't be able to put it down. Well, on a ship, there's also one very famous book. Anybody ever heard of Christmas Carol? Who wrote the Christmas Christmas Carol? Do you guys know? Hmm? No, no, not John Carol. Dickens. Uh, I'm going to say some first name. Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens wrote a Christmas Carol. Well, the book when he wrote it in the late 1800s was so popular in England. The people started making black market copies of it and selling it on the streets, undermining how much money Charles Dickens could have made on his book. So he sued, and I don't exactly remember who he sued, but regardless, he sued somebody to recoup the losses of potentially tens of thousands of dollars of black market copies. Well, he brought a copy, a first edition copy of his book, to the trial, and he took notes, for whatever reason, inside the book about the ongoing of the trial. Well, that book ended up being sold, I think, after his death, and a, an English collector bought it. Well, that English collector then moved to the United States. Well, uh, he then sold it to an American who treasured it like it was the Shroud of Tour. He just, this was like the most amazing thing he could ever own. Well, the original owner was on Lusitania, or was going to be on Lusitania. And he said he knew somebody in Ireland, and it was telling the truth, he was not trying to scam the new owner. But he knew somebody in England, or, or Ireland, excuse me, who was a, an old book, um, uh, what is it, a cure, uh, what is it when you can uh, appraise something? It was an old book appraiser. So he was going to be able to offer what like the new value of this book would be. So the old owner, the night before the Lusitania, left New York to go to Ireland. The old book owner went to the new book owner and was like, can I please borrow it? I would just love to know what the new value of this book is. Can I get an appraise? The new owner was like, oh, I really don't want to. Like, come on. And he goes, I promise you, I will treat it like it's my own child. As soon as I get on the ship, I will lock it into my safe. It will not leave. It's going to go straight to this appraiser. I promise I'll bring it back. And the new owner reluctantly said yes. So this, the original owner is on the ship. The torpedo hits. The, what is the one thing he goes and runs back to his room to grab is that book. He opens up the safe, he pulls the book out, he puts it into a bag, and he goes and sprints back around. He can potentially die himself. It's like, if I die, take this book with me because I promised I would protect it. So he gets out onto the you know, top of the ship. People are just diving overboard. And he gets into a very, very overcrowded lifeboat. Well, unfortunately, this lifeboat was so overcrowded that when it reached the surface of the water, the weight of the people in it started to pull it down. It ended up taking on water. He realizes, we got to jump out. So he starts shouting, get out, you know, save yourselves. Um, and as he says later on, there were women and children, and you know, people were just in such shock of everything. They didn't get out. He dove out, and they just kind of sat there while the whole thing just sucked them down into the grave. Like, they literally, they had just jumped, you know, like they were so in shock, they just drowned. Unfortunately, as he jumped, he dropped his bag that had the book. And the bag with the book went down with that lifeboat and went down at the bottom of the land. That was an original copy of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. He had taken notes on his trial. It's one of the most, I'm telling you, read that book. If you have any, and I don't read A Christmas Carol, although I recommend it. If you are a book reader and if you like history at all, Dead White, it's a fantastic movie. It's a fantastic book. It almost could be a movie. This the book was so good. But that was on that ship. So the United States, you probably were taught in high school that the singular list of was the reason the United States got in the war. That's been, for whatever reason, the conception for, for a long time. Singular Lusitania got the Americans. 
But actually, Americans didn't really care. The way a lot of Americans looked at it, they were shocked. 120 Americans dead in one month. They're like, that's, that's a really big deal. Not on a neutral ship. It was just a cruise line. Like, what the what? But Americans often looked at it as like, most of these people were super wealthy. Most of America was just kind of obviously middle class. They're like, what the heck are you doing on a boat like that in the middle of a war anyway? You're going to go to the continent in which they're fighting a war like this? Your fault. It took two years before the United States ended the war. It had nothing to do with the Lusitania. People were outraged, just like, hey, you're killing Americans. But then they looked at those Americans going, you shouldn't have been there in the first place. So here's a newspaper from the New York Times. The Lusitania being sunk. The headline, Lusitania sunk by a submarine. Probably 1,260 dead. It's a good estimation. It's again, it was a total of, oh, it was a total of 1,200. Um, twice torpedoed off the Irish coast. Six, 15 minutes. Captain Turner saved from and Vanderbilt missing. Those two of the you know, wealthy Americans. Washington believes that a grave crisis is at hand. Still shocks the president. Still took two years for the United States to get on the board. So while the United States remained at peace, remained neutral, the, the government still prepared. They kind of knew at some point the U.S. was going to get dragged into it. Uh, there was a progressive, a progressive opposition to it. There was a European war. We need to stay out of it. Uh, but the United States was starting to slowly become outraged at um, some propaganda that, that was produced, as well as uh, the, the method and way people are dying. It seemed like honorable and okay. Okay, if you're going to shoot them with a gun, if you're going to blow them up with a bomb, okay, that's warfare. But the Germans used chemical warfare, as we saw in terms of, like, say, um, chlorine gas. That was almost seen as, like, unethical. And so it is actually against international law. You're not allowed to use, which is the silliest thing if you think about it. Like, you're in a war, use any means you can. But because it's so. It can kill people so indiscriminately. Uh, it's actually against international law. You can kill with the gun, but you can't kill them with gas. Uh, so here are a few posters of when the United States does start to get uh, riled up and do get involved. There's some uh, American propaganda posters in terms of getting people in. This is one of the most famous posters of all time. This is obviously Uncle Sam. He's actually designed after this car. This is uncle. It was like a literal human being that's designed after. Take up the sword of justice. So, of course, uh, you know, as I said, the United States does not get in uh, against Lusitania. Although, uh, and so Woodrow Wilson actually runs on his re-election campaign with the slogan, he kept us out of war. It was, hey, look, there's this war going on. It's been going on for three years, and we haven't gotten in. That's because of Woodrow Wilson. What happened six weeks after he was inaugurated? The United States declares war on Germany. <laughs> we get the war. But he ran on the, he kept us out of war. Well, the reason is because of the Zimmerman telegram. Did you, guys, did you guys study this? So very, very quickly, the Zimmerman telegram was a telegram from Germany to Mexico. It was the Germans realizing if the Americans get in, they're going to get on the side of the French and British. They're strong. They've, they've got a lot of numbers. They've got the technology. That's going to suck. So the Germans asked the Mexican government, hey, declare war on the United States keep the U.S. occupied over there, and when we win this war in Europe, we'll then come down and help you defeat the Americans on the North American continent, and when we win, we'll give you back Arizona, New Mexico, California, uh, Colorado, Nevada. We'll give you back those states that were, you know, that region of land that was taken that the United States won the New Mexican-American War. Well, the Mexican military was by no means modernized. It could not have stood a chance against the American military. So the Mexican government scoffed, they're like, that's suicide. And how do we trust you anyway? Let's say for the second war when we did it, how do we know that you're actually gonna win that war? How do we know that you're actually gonna come back and help us? Like, this is this is dumb. Well, that was brought to Washington, to, to Wilson. Wilson leaked it to the press, the press released it. Boom, got the Americans involved. Wilson gives a speech called, uh, and says the world must be made safe for democracy. It declares war. And that's then when we get the first draft since the Civil War. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but. So General Pershing can take army to the front. A draft bill is signed by the president. The slips of, of numbers that represent individual men across the country, based on their date, were enclosed in gelatin capsules and placed into a great bowl, which was sealed and kept under lock and key. 
So this will look like this is paper and jelly capsules, and then dropped into that bowl. Boom. And then they filled that bowl and then they drew. And so this was how they decided which American men were going to go with going to be drafted first. So here's Woodrow Wilson pulling out the first pill. And thus, if you entered the draft, or if you were almost enlisted, and you had whatever this first number was, then So, of course, there was no audio at the time. Let's see if they, they show the first number. Oh, they didn't show the first number. Well, then, if you had that number, you were the first drafted. And the next number, that's probably the vice president. I forget who it is. It's obviously all ceremonial blindfolded as if, you know, that makes it even more fair, but whatever. Probably Secretary of War right there. Okay, so we keep doing this. Now watch. Keep going, keep going, keep going. So then the numbers were then released outside. They get the radio. Okay, we this. Oh, they also started. And as they would read a number, they painted out. And so the New York Herald. Number 258. And people would celebrate. Hey, those people are going to go die. <laughs> and take the next number. 2,500. This guy is very good at the show campaign. 2,500. Hooray! Get your hat back. You dropped it. Where'd the girl go? So, beat back the Hun with Liberty Bonds. Buy more Liberty Bonds, must children die, and mothers plead in vain. Remember your first thrill, this one is for immigrants. Remember your first thrill of American liberty. Your duty is to buy United States government bonds, the second level of all taxes. So what the Liberty Bond was, was to prosecute the war rather than just raising taxes, although they did. They also said, hey, loan us money, because wars are extraordinarily expensive. So you would buy a bond. So bonds would come in different denominations, a dollar, five bucks, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, a thousand bucks, whatever. And then each of them would have an interest rate and an expiration date. And so let's say that you had a ten, about a $10 bond, with a 2% interest rate that expired in five years. Well, that meant that you gave the government 10 bucks today, then you know, they took that money to help spend on the war. Five years from now, when that expiration date hits, you would then return to a bank and you get a 2% interest, you get $12. So you would give the government 10 bucks now for $12 five years from now. When those the expiration dates, would be longer or shorter, and depending on the length of the expiration date, then you've got higher interest. So let's say you had, and I'm going to make up this number, but let's say you bought a $10 interest rate with a 10-year expiration date. Then you might get 50% interest, which means in 10 years when it expires, you take that bond to bank, and you get 15 bucks. That kind of thing. Does that make sense? So that was a way for the government to make a lot of money up front without just constantly raising taxes to help pay for the wars. It was their, and then they made it a civic duty. Give the government money, help them to pay for the war. Um, and they would, and they, were, they would do these through a liberty bond days. And so they would just set up the cities would do it, the states would do it, the federal government would do it. They would have these liberty bond days. Okay, everybody buy a liberty bond, donate the federal government money. You'll get interest on it after the expiration of that bond. I actually had a bond that was on the bond when I was a kid. It was really cool. It went for that day and expired in the middle of seven dollars. Actually, I take it back. That was like 60 bucks. Pretty good bond. All right, so it's science in the front, or science to the front. On March 3rd, 1915, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautic, Aeronautics is formed. Um, its initial goal is the study of air flight. Uh, eventually, that would become NASA. 
National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Two weeks later, after this was discovered, Pluto was discovered in Flagstaff. Or excuse me, two weeks after this was founded, Pluto was discovered in Flagstaff, Arizona. At that point, it was 1920. The National Academy of Sciences is mobilized. We still have the National Academy of Sciences. And then more related research and efforts, psychologists, chemists, physicists, and the engineers were, were developed with the uh, idea of developing chemical weapons, with the development of IQ tests, um, and were all done as a means of competing with Europe's technological innovations. So as they were saying in the videos, Europe was developing technologically to try to prosecute the war. And so they kind of sped up technological innovation and invention. The United States wasn't participating in the war, so we had no kind of fundamental reason to spend a lot of money and spike it up. So America was kind of looking at itself, and certainly the government, going, they're going to pass us when this war is over, or they're going to be really far ahead of us, so we need to find a way to keep up with them, so that way, with them being Europe, so that way we can have certain innovations and technological inventions as well. U.S. goes into combat. The Allies are, are in a lot of trouble. It really is the United States that, that wins this war. They have extraordinarily high casualties. Then at the same time, we have the Russian Revolution, which leads to a German armistice with Russia, which means the Germans can now take all of their Eastern Front soldiers and move to the Western Front, reinforce them, make it more difficult for the French and the Germans. Um, so the United States sends its American Expeditionary Force, led by General Pershing right here, and halts German advances into France in the spring of 1918. It then leads to multiple uh, Allied victories in the Meuse River and our Gulf Force. This was a particularly hellish one. There was a low United States casualty rate by comparison uh, of 53,000 dead on the battlefield, 116,000 dead by all causes. Um, and then the Spanish flu, which killed 250,000 soldiers. 250,000 soldiers by the Spanish, died by the Spanish flu. All told, approximately uh, 650 or 750,000 Americans died by the Spanish flu, which by today's population, would be the equivalent of about 1.7, 1.8 million. So in comparison, just if you kind of use the growth of the population in terms of inflation, we're at around 500 something thousand dead from COVID. The United States, based on uh, Spanish flu numbers, would be, uh, Spanish flu, excuse me, based on the modern population would be about 1.6, 1.7 million. So we're still about a million short, again, in terms of inflation of population to the Spanish flu. Let's make sure our phones are familiar. So again, that would be the final armistice line. And oh, final repeat. So the final casualties of war, Austria-Hungary lost 1.1 million, Germany lost 2 million, France 1.4 million, Great Britain 723,000, Ottoman Empire, which disappeared after this, 804,000, Russia 1.8 million, the United States 114,000. Again, it was low, but the United States got in pretty late, and the War was fought in our, in our, in our streets. Um, after the war, the map looks totally different. Poland is carved out. Ukraine is carved out. This was former Russia right here. Um, then Ottoman Empire all disappears. Turkey uh, becomes a nation. Bulgaria, Albania. Um, what, what is this one? Moldavia, Malicia, uh, Montenegro, Yugoslavia, Austria, Hungary, Transylvania. Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia, Pro, uh, well, that's all Czechoslovakia right there. I mean, it's, it totally redesigns the map. So, with the war over, it ends on the 11th hour of the 11th day, the 11th month of 1918, at 11 a.m., November 11th. Uh, Wilson offers 14 points as the treaty, and it's basically his goal is to stop the war forever. Um, unfortunately, he catches the Spanish flu, he survives, um, and then also he has to try to negotiate with the American Senate. All treaties must be ratified by the Senate. The Senate was Republican, he was a Democrat, and he wanted to start um, the League of Nations, which is akin to the modern United Nations, and the American Republicans thought that was giving up our sovereignty, so they, they wouldn't have it. He came home, Europe was ready to sign his treaty. He came home and negotiated with Republicans, and by the time he got back, they had thrown it out. And, uh, and so it lost, you know, kind of lost it. They accepted some aspects of it, but basically the French and English wanted to just 
crush the Germans and they would. Um, it's like a, oh, the last soldier to die. So everybody knew within for days, everybody knew the war was to end at 11 a.m. on the morning of November 11th. Everybody knew. Officers stood in their um, trenches counting down 10, 9, 8, and at 11 a.m., they all blew whistles, and that meant stop firing. Well, with literally a few seconds remaining, this one American soldier out of nowhere dives over the top and starts charging towards a German, German pillbox with the, with the machine gun. They were told to charge. This guy just decides to do it. He's screaming, run straight out. Three, two, one. The Germans mow him down. They blow, the officers blow the whistles. The war is over. Or the armistice means the end, but you know, it's in place, which means no firing. The guy falls dead. That was the last death, was this one American soldier. So one of the top charged to pillbox. Nobody knows. Was he trying to commit suicide? Did he never, maybe never get a chance to go over the top and fight? Did he want to die in battle? Did he want the last death? Did he think it would be cool to be able to run up and kill a couple guys right in the last second? And now I just got the last deaths, you know, the last kills of the war. Nobody knows. That was the last death in that war. Was that one American right over the top, unordered, and ends up getting mowed down? So this is the hollow mirrors where uh, the treaty was signed to end the war. Here's the ticket tape parade in downtown New York, New York City. So I'll bring the end of the war and the Let's see, okay, I want to just get to. Oh, yeah. This is guy look. This is uh, David Lloyd George, Prime Minister of Britain. This guy looked like Colonel Zod from Hunter One Dominations. But I'm not even kidding. That look. You know, I'm being a little odd, or is that like seriously looks like. I wonder if that's who the dog was name was drawn out. I'm not exactly. All right, so I just want to get to okay, it's the Treaty of Versailles. So the Treaty of Versailles was the Treaty of Hamilton. They required that the Germans pay 269 billion gold marks, which would be equivalent to 64 billion dollars then, and equivalent to about one trillion dollars today. An extraordinarily large amount of money in reparations. It was later reduced to about 400 billion dollars. Many economists and historians feel that this actually was part of the key that led to the collapse of America, the economy in the 1920s, and so the seeds of fascism. The Germans were forced to sign the war guilt clause, making them sign that they were at fault, which said, quote, the Allied and Associated Governments affirm that Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany, Germany and her allies. The Germans were restricted to having an army of only 100,000 men on long-term contracts. Why on long-term? Because they couldn't train. You were just soldiers in defense in the event of some emergency. You couldn't train. The reason why they couldn't train is they didn't want them over time to just recycle those guys and say, okay, We'll just have a whole lot of 100,000 on short term contracts. Every six months, we'll just train a new 100,000. And that would have been a couple of years, we'll have several million trained soldiers. No, it's 100,000 men on long term contracts that would could develop a larger army. They were not allowed any tanks or heavy artillery in their military. They were not allowed air force. They actually ended up being a very good air force in the Their navy was limited to 15,000 men, six small battleships, six cruisers, 12 destroyers, and no submarines. They were. Just decimate military. The All Saint Lorraine, which is this part over here, uh, was, which was captured by Germany from France in 1870, was given back to France. The Saar, which was an important German coal field, uh, was given to France for 15 years, after which a plebiscite or local vote would decide its ownership. So keeping energy away from Germany. Poland was cut out of Germany, see here, and made an independent country with a roots to the sea, right here. A corner of land cutting Germany in two. The Danzig was a major port in East Prussia, Germany. It uh, was also to be under international control. All German and Turkish colonies were taken away and put under Allied control. Finland, Lithuania, Latvia, and Czechoslovakia were made independent. Austria Hungary was split up, and Yugoslavia was created. 
Although now you can assign those small amounts of information as well. The aims, the United States want peace and to avoid another war. That's 14 points you're supposed to give. Because the French wanted to punish Germany and create a weak Germany, obviously get the rise of Hitler, and what is his whole goal? Bring in Germany back and get World War II. Britain, the French, no, no, excuse me, public opinion in Britain wanted the same, or had the same opinion as the French, but actually the British leadership did fear that the harsh trade would have the opposite effect that Germans might want revenge. They went along with the French, but in the end, their, their instinct was correct. Germany lost 13% of its land, 12% of its people, 40% of its iron resources, 50% of agricultural uh, production, 10% of coal. German public opinion soon swung against this dictated peace. While the Germans who signed them were called November criminals, the results, the map of Europe was redrawn. Numerous countries were left in large minority groups. There were three and a half million Germans in Czechoslovakia alone. The League of Nations was fatally weakened without the United States and its army to work forced decisions. Many Germans, obviously, including Hitler, felt they were unfairly treated. And after all, they had just signed an armistice, not a unilateral surrender, and the Allies had never occupied the deep Germany. So that is the history of World War I. There's another version. What if World War I had been a bargain? Germany, Austria, and Italy are standing together in the middle of the bar when, when Serbia bumps into Austria and spills Austria's wine. Austria demands Serbia buy a whole new suit because of new beer stains on its trouser leg. Germany expresses its support for Austria's point of view. Britain recommends that everybody just calms down. Serbia points out that it can't afford a whole new suit, but offers to pay for the cleaning of Austria's trousers. Russia and Serbia look at Austria. Austria asks Serbia who is looking at. Russia suggests that Austria should leave its little brother alone. Austria inquires as to whose army will assist Russia in doing so. Germany appeals to Britain that France has been looking at it and it is sufficiently out of order for Britain not to intervene. Britain replies that France can look at whoever it wants to, that Britain is looking at Germany too, and what is Germany going to do about it? Germany tells Russia to stop looking at Austria or Germany will render Austria, Russia incapable of such an action anymore. Britain and France ask Germany whether it's looking at Belgium. Turkey and Germany go off into a corner and whisper. When they come back, Turkey makes a show of not looking at anyone. Germany rolls up its sleeves, looks at France, and punches Belgium. France and Britain punch Germany. Austria punches Russia. Germany punches Britain and France with one hand and Russia with the other. Russia throws a punch at Germany, but misses and nearly falls over. Japan calls over from the other side of the room that it's on Britain's side, but stays there. Italy surprises everyone by punching Austria. Australia punches Perth. Turkey and gets punched back. There are no hard feelings because Britain made Australia do it. France gets thrown through a plate glass window, but gets back up and carries on fighting. Russia gets thrown through another one, gets knocked out, suffers brain damage, and wakes up with a complete personality change. Italy throws a punch at Austria and misses, but Austria falls over anyway. Italy raises both fists in the air and runs round the room chanting. America waits till Germany is about to fall over from sustained punching from Britain and France, then walks over and smashes it with a bar stool, then pretends it won the fight all by itself. By now, all the chairs are broken, the big mirror over the bar is shattered. Britain, France, and America agree that Germany threw the first punch, so the whole thing is Germany's fault. While Germany is still unconscious, they go through its pockets, steal its wallet, and buy drinks for all their friends. There's World War I in a bar code. Any questions, comments, turns, questions, questions of any kind? All right. That is World War I in an hour and a half. Let me just take 10 more out of here. All right, Augustine, Andre, Here. Ava, Basil, Bernice, Destiny, Here. Dylan, 
Esteban, here. Tim, Ian, here. Jace, here. Johnny, here. Lucas, here. Madison, here. Michaela, here. Mark, here. McKenna, Sam, Sierra. Did I hear Sierra? No. Three, six, nine, twelve, one, two, three. All right. So, what day are you turning in this on? 13. I promise you, if your first line, you'll be out of the class in five minutes. Your second, you'll be out in about 10. Um, we have Zoom on Tuesday and then Thursday, and that's the end of the lecture series for the semester. And then it's the following Tuesday that we have uh, you know, the turn in. Assignment. And again, if you want to want to log in because you're not quite done, you want to finish it in class, you know, I'll be there for an hour for that. So I'll be there the whole time. Um, you can just turn it in. Is there another Zoom on the Thursday afternoon? No, there will be a Zoom. I'll hold the class until we can end. I'll be doing something else though. For for those who show up. And then it'll be there again for people who just you know who maybe turn it on 13th and need to redo it, I can be right there. But I'll be there for the whole hour for that. Anybody else? I love you guys. This was a great semester. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on Zoom on Tuesday. See you.